Hello and welcome to the English legal system. This lecture should benefit those of you studying for an LLB or an associated degree or maybe just general interest. So the first question we ask ourselves is what is law? To start with let's have some wise words from a famous legal scholar Sir William Blackstone. Sir William Blackstone was an 18th century lawyer. He was a judge and he was an academic at Oxford. He was the first person to try and pull together a comprehensive analysis of the English common law. What he says here is helpful for our purposes. He says this, I think it is an undeniable position that a competent knowledge of the laws of that society in which we live is the proper accomplishment of every gentleman and scholar and highly useful almost said essential part of a liberal and polite education. I hope with this lecture that we can provide a general and competent summation of the law of England and Wales. So the aim is to have a basic understanding of the history of the common law to identify several key features of the English legal system and to recognise the way that you can succeed in an English legal system unit within your studies. To start with, before we get into the history of law and the legal system, it is prudent to ask a very broad question. That question being, what is law? We are talking about the English legal system and the laws of the land. But what is that law? What is that law of the land? One would suspect this is a simple question to answer. It has, however, proved difficult and elusive and stretched the minds of people such as Aristotle and Plato. What is the content of law? People have struggled with what is the content of a law and how do we recognise a rule as law? These are deep and philosophical questions that we explored later on. For now though, let's think about this in a practical way. The starting point is that law is essentially concerned with the problem of social order. In order that we can live together in a society, we need to have rules to govern how we are going to live. They can be of many different types. These can be informal social rules, rules of behaviour, rules of dress, rules of conversation. These social rules are complied with as a matter of convention. If you don't follow the rule, you may be subjected to social disapproval or excluded from the group. However, more complex and developed societies need more formal rules in order to maintain the ability of people to live together in an orderly way. So in short, what we can say is that when we speak of the law in a democratic society, what we're talking about are the rules that govern how we live and how we do business. And we are thinking about the rules that are backed by the coercive power of the state. What we mean by coercive power of the state is that these are rules that we have to obey. And if we don't obey these rules, we will be made to pay some sort of penalty, pay a fine or perhaps go to prison. So for the purposes of this lecture, when we talk about the law, we're talking about rules that we're obliged to follow. If we break a criminal law, then we may have to pay a fine or we may have to go to prison. If we break a non-criminal law, what we call a civil law, we usually have to pay money compensation, what we call in legal terminology damages. That law is fundamentally concerned with order in society. It's not actually a new idea. What Aristotle said is that law is order and that good law is good order. He was writing about such things even before the birth of Christ. This backs up the idea of the purpose of law. What do we mean when we talk about a legal system? The legal system constitutes all of the constituent parts of the law and the surrounding machinery of justice. So it comprises of laws produced by lawmaking bodies, parliaments, legislatures, judiciary, and it also includes the institutions processes and the personnel contributing to the operation and enforcement of those laws. So this includes legislation, acts of parliament, the common law, the decisions of judges in courts, 
referring to the workings of courts, the judges and what they do, and the way in which they are appointed. We are also referring to legal professionals, solicitors, barristers, legal executives, etc. And within criminal context, we are talking about police, about prosecutors and about the juries. In a broader context, we are talking about those organisations that support access to justice, the Citizens Advice Bureau and the provision of legal aid. All of these groups, institutions, personnel and processes, all are part of the English legal system. They provide the machinery for the justice system to work. So this is just a rough outline of what we mean when we talk about the English legal system as a whole. Each of these needs exploring more depth. The UK is made up of England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. However, the English legal system refers just to England and Wales. Because Scotland and Northern Ireland both have different legal systems. At this point, we need to have a sense of where the laws are coming from. What are the sources of laws that we deal with here? There are currently basically four sources of English law. One, the English Parliament. Two, the UK Supreme Court, and below that, the Royal Courts of Justice, the Common Law Courts. Three, the European Union, for now anyway. And four, the European Court of Human Rights. So our law comes from Parliament. That's legislation, acts of Parliament, written laws. It also comes from the common law decisions of judges sitting in the courts, Supreme Court, Royal Court of Appeal, the High Courts, etc. It also comes from Europe, the European Commission, European Council of Ministers, as well as the European Court of Human Rights. We have the UK Supreme Court and other courts of record providing the English sources of law, the decisions that constitute the common law. We also have the UK Parliament providing the written law. But we also have directly applicable law emanating from Europe that is applicable in the English legal system. And these are laws that come from the EU and are produced by the Council, the Parliament and the Commission. And they sit in Brussels, Belgium. There is also law that emanates from the European Court of Human Rights, which relates to the ECHR, the European Convention on Human Rights. In 1998, the UK Parliament passed the Human Rights Act 1998, incorporating the ECHR into English law. So the ECHR becomes a part of English law, an additional source of our law. The largest body of law, however, is the English common law, and thus can be seen as the most important. So we need to look at this and see how it developed many hundreds of years ago. What do we mean by English common law? We are talking about the laws of the land, the laws that we comply with, that are essentially created and applied by judges, sitting in court, deciding on disputes in individual cases, in disputes that are decided. Legal principles articulated by judges on individual cases in court, which is why the common law is sometimes referred to as case law, because it emanates from individual cases. The law develops from judges following the judgments of other judges who have decided similar cases previously. And judges follow the reasoning and the legal principles by previous judges in previous cases. What they are doing is following the doctrine of precedent. So a judge decides a case today and looks back to see where judges decided a similar case in the past and what reasoning and principles did that judge apply. The judge will follow that reasoning today, and that is the doctrine of precedent. Cases of similar decisions are documented in yearbooks and reports. These decisions are collected. They are applied to new cases that come before the courts. Now focus on the history of development of the common law. Blackstone, the common law is to be found in the records of our courts of justice, in books of reported judicial decisions, in treatise of learned sages of the profession, described and handed down to us from the ages of ancient antiquity. These are the laws that gave rise to the maxims and customs, which is known by the name of the common law.
William Blackstone attempted first to bring together all of the common law of England. He did this in the 18th century. He gave a series of lectures in Oxford. Lectures were published as commentaries of the laws of England in four volumes. He attempted to systemise all of the laws made by judges over many years. First attempt to state the entire corpus of the common law. Still, the comprehensive summary of English law compiled by a single author. Clear, sophisticated and highly regarded. In fact, Abraham Lincoln used to read Blackstone by candlelight, responsible for many legal phrases. Better that ten guilty men escape than one innocent is guilty. How did the common law develop? A good place to start is 1066 with William the Conqueror, although it should be borne in mind that it was not the case that there was no law prior to this. William was the first king to have the idea of a unified system of law throughout England and Wales. He invaded from France in 1066. There was already a functioning law and local customs in different shires. There were systems of law from people that had already invaded, but they were not unitary amongst the different shires. Each county and shire had its own local courts varying from community to community. These were arbitrary under the feudal system. The accused was asked to hold red hot irons and things such as this, more like a, a trial by ordeal, a way to seek to establish the truth. If the wound healed within a few days, he would be set free and deemed innocent, or if not, then would be executed. The thought was that if he was innocent, then God would intervene, intervene with a miracle. Local courts and customs. William wanted to establish power and order in this unruly kingdom. He understood that in order to exercise power, he needed a central system of justice which he, as king, had power and laws obeyed by citizens. He invented the Curia Regis, the king's court. A court of law, but also a royal household. The king and some of his most trusted advisers, where people could bring disputes and then have them decided by the king. Kings travelled around the country, taking a court and courtiers with them, due to the fact that it was difficult for populations to travel. So they were processed in different parts of the country. Travel around with the Curia Regis and people would bring William their grievances. They would then give a ruling on the dispute. The king would sit on a bench and hear cases in his own court, therefore the court of King's Bench. This was the beginning of a centralised and unified system of laws. William also integrated the ideas of juries into the system of justice. The royal ministers or justices would look for the estates to establish how much tax to charge. So 12 free men would need to decide and testify under oath the value of each estate. This was called the jury, later used for finding facts in civil and criminal cases. This was the essential beginnings of the common law system. After William, there was much fighting and disruption in the country during the reign of Stephen and After the, uh, the reign of uh, Stephen, Henry II wanted stability and to restore the law of the land. He played a big role and like William, wanted a single system of justice for the whole country under the control of the king. For the first time under him, judges were sent out on circuits travelling around the country. Only 18 judges were available to travel around and Henry ordered five of them to stay in London so that they constituted the king's bench which sat in Westminster Hall. When judges travelled, they had to dispense the law that they had been decided in Westminster. So this was gradually local laws were being replaced by national laws, laws common to all. The advantage of the travelling judges, 
is uh, they were less likely to influence and corrupt. So it was good if they came from Westminster to dispense justice from London, protected from corruption rather than having local judges dishing out local, local laws. In time, the decisions were written down and recorded and so this practice of precedent applied and was cited in court and applied in later cases. This system gradually spread the common law from the King's Bench in Westminster and out to the whole of the country as a unified common law. First system of law reporting was from 1272 in the early years of Edward I. Yearbooks were the principal sources. The original reports were written in either French or Latin, so the common law spread throughout the country and as the royal courts became established, the importance of local customs began to fade away. Content of most law at this time was to prevent bloodshed, recognising personal rights to property freedom and punishing people who committed violent acts. Some difficulties of the common law court led to the development of equity. The Assizes system of judges going around the country actually lasted until 1971, which is quite an extraordinary fact. The current system now of travelling judges from higher court divisions, the High Court of Justice in London, they travel around outside of London, continuing a circuit system. After Henry II, Innovative use was made of the jury dealing with criminal cases. This was bringing people from certain locations together, bringing together 12 good and lawful men periodically to tell the king whether they knew or suspected the robbery, etc., and identify members of the community. This use of the jury was the precursor to the grand jury used in America today, and it also forms the basis of two-stage system of UK criminal law, initially on indictment and then on trial. Interestingly, this goes back to William and then Henry II. Until the 12th century, Vendessa blood feuds part of life. The end of this coincided with the King's courts. The courts did not punish criminals, but provided a peaceful means for resolution instead of disputes with violence and instead encouraged to go back to the public forum to the king and his justices to be offered a remedy. The idea of encouraging not taking law into one's own hand. The public forum instead for land contract, debt to be resolved, etc. Courts supported social order and tranquility within the state. The courts underpinning the social order and not just about punishing people. Peaceful resolution of disputes supported social harmony, and this was needed to protect the modern times. Common law has influenced legal systems around the world and spread to other jurisdictions. The English common law tradition has spread to where the UK is colonised. Therefore, Australia, the USA, Canada and New Zealand. Other countries might have a mixed system like Africa, India and parts of the Far East. The common law system, though, however, has been very influential throughout the world in imparting our principles. In the next lecture, I will deal with the doctrine of precedent and we'll look at more case law and how this is applied in the real world setting.